Thank you very much, it's so nice. Okay, so folks, uh, my name is Jorge Zuniga. This is Jim Peck, and on the other side we have Rakesh Srivastava. Our research, uh, our, uh, our, our team at the Biomechanics Research Building at UNO and Innovative Prosthetics and Orthotics decided to join to work in a project that's helping families and people around the world. So, uh, the name of the project is Cyborg Beast. Uh, Cyborg Beast is a line of low cost orthotic devices that are manufactured using additive manufacturing. Uh, what we have here is one of the devices for our, one of our research subjects. And typically, uh, the devices for her are, are, are very uh, heavy, uh, difficult to use, and expensive. Uh, as you can see, uh, so, or you will see, our devices are lighter, less expensive, and very easy to use. With a slight, a slight flexion of the wrist, you can activate these hands. We use any other joints, wrist, uh, elbow, shoulder, and so on. And uh, we're also now exploring uh, uh, electronic devices as well. A uh, few years ago, we decided to share our files with everybody. So we open sourced this. Not only the files of the hand, but also a manual, an instruction manual. Uh, this file, as you can see, has been downloaded for many, many people around the world. Not only download the files, but they, are, they have also manufactured their own devices. Uh, very recently, we opened a laboratory in the biggest rehabilitation center in South America that's fully dedicated to provide these devices to people in need. Uh, due to the significance of the work we are doing, uh, uh, MSN.com, the Microsoft Network, uh, selected our, the CyberBeast as one of the top five inventions in 2014. Don't get me wrong, we have had a fair amount you know, of headlines. But you know what? That's the least important thing ever. Uh, we have never forgotten the families and children that have allowed us to accomplish our mission. Uh, I'm not, I decided not to show you data. I'm a researcher. My job is 100% research. I don't do nothing else but research on this, 100%. So I decided not to show you data instead showing you the, the, the great impact we're having around the world. So now, what I'll do, I'm gonna have Jim Peck uh, talking a little bit about how the hand works and a little bit about some other designs we're working on. Okay, does this work? Okay, good. Hi, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our device. Um, when a child is born with an upper extremity reduction, most of the time they're referred to Shriners for a prosthesis. Now that prosthesis that they get, Shriners isn't going to give them an expensive one. And Shriners is a great business, I'm not saying anything against them. But they're going to get the most low cost device they have. That device entails a shoulder harness, a heavy forearm component, and a hook device at the end. Now research tells us there's over 50% rejection and abandonment of those hook devices. So our goal was to come up with a device that's lightweight, functional, and aesthetically pleasing for these kids. This device weighs under three and a half ounces, so it's much lighter than the heavy hook they have. No shoulder harness is required. When the kids come in, we um, meticulously measure their uninvolved hands so we can match the size of their prosthesis to their uninvolved hand. We also can custom fit this to their hand by heating up this mesh component here and molding it directly to their palms so they have a good fit and it's very comfortable for them. As well as I mentioned, this device is activated by wrist flexion. So they bend the wrist, it bends the fingers. All of our devices also have this BOA component on the back so that the children can adjust the tension on the device to find their sweet spot so they have the most strength and function with their device. Um, also, these devices come in a multitude of colors, including glow in the dark. Now, we have never had a child request a skin tone device yet. We've had some great colors come out of it, but none of those. 
Um, after doing this for a while, we realized that many of our children are having transradial reductions, so then we came up with an elbow-driven device. Much like the wrist-driven device, elbow flexion produces finger flexion. This one's a little different, though, in that it also has a component to provide pronation and supination. So they can adjust that for whatever activity they're completing at that time. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to this little girl up here and notice how short her residual arm is. She has a very short lever arm, short lever arm, but yet she's still able to use this to complete the box and blocks test, which is one of our evaluations we use to test the function of the device. Um, can you play the video? Um, Anyway, you can see that she's very functional, even though she has such a short lever. Okay. okay, now I'm going to let Rakesh talk a few minutes about some of the printers and the other devices we have. Thank you, Jane. So during the process of our research with the upper extremity, we were also thinking about the printer. Our focus was on the low cost printed, medical printed devices. And there are some printers in the market, they are pretty low cost, but it was not able to do the things that we wanted to do on our research lab. So our in-house research team put their heads together and we developed this printer where we can print out the medical grade prosthetics devices, mostly for upper extremity. Uh, there are some features built in there where we were not able to achieve in the market, um, which we added on this, and we are continually, continuously going to improve this model so that it's cost effective, and the goal that we have set ourselves for a low, prost low cost prosthetics and orthotics devices can be met, just not up here in the US, but also worldwide. We did work on the upper extremity. Now our research team, we are working on the lower extremity. Uh, definitely the numbers, if you look into the lower extremity, goes higher than the upper extremity. Uh, the both goes for prosthetics and orthotics. If, just to give you a simple example about an ankle foot orthosis, which is very commonly used for patients with stroke, they develop the foot drop, and they get an AFO, plastic AFO, to walk, ambulate, and be able to uh, do their functions. We are working on some of the devices to see how we can make it available through the 3D printed prosthetics so it's more functional, less time involved in the development of the devices as the ankle foot orthosis, if they come to our clinic, it's a multiple steps that they have to follow. So through this technology, we can achieve that goal. We can customize to their need as every individual is different. One of the things that we are also looking into the lower extremity is the prosthetics use. Being an amputee, above knee amputee for 33 years, you know, we have developed so many stuff as far as the knee goes, the foot goes, the ankle goes, but to me it always felt like the socket, which is the top part where the foot, foot and the knee attaches to. So if this is not customized, this part of the prosthesis, it is not very functional. We can add any gadgets below it, but if it is not customized, it's not going to be functional for an MPUT, and it will be pretty difficult to walk. So through the 3D printed technology, we are hoping that we can improve, we can make it more uh, functional, much more custom fit devices to our patients, and we can provide them so that they can reach the maximum rehab potential. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious about your custom 3D printers. Uh, you mentioned features now available in the current market. Which features you added to your custom ones? Sure, I could talk to you about probably the one, the, the one, the most important one is that we are also experimenting with antibacterial materials. Uh, I do have to say, folks, we don't sleep very much. We I usually average four hours a day, and that's on a good day. So we're trying to do it all. Uh, why not, right? Um, so we are experimenting with antibacterial materials. Well, 
uh, there's few ways to do this, right? So the way that we know best is put some particles of metal, right? So when you mix, you have a material with metal, some sort of metal, and uh, plastic is very abrasive and it ruins the entire system, especially the tip of the extruder. Uh, so that's one of the things, you know, we, we made and patented a, a, a hardened steel uh, that's, you know, it's designed specifically to avoid those problems. Um, other features, you know, is dual extrusion. Uh, basically, dual ext what that does, you know, is it prints something soft and something hard. So specifically, you know, for the tip of the fingers, we have issues with the printers we have right now. And we're talking about low-cost machines. Folks, I have a very expensive machines in my lab. One of my machines I have is $200,000. Those ones can print soft materials, no, no problem, right? But the, the low-cost machines do not. And sometimes we feel the need to print something softer with something hard, as simple as that. So our machine does that. Um, that's one of, the, one of the things that are, are very important. And there's, of course, other features that I can't specifically remember right now. But those are the two more, uh, most important. Oh, the third one is the cost. Uh, in the research world, you spend, when you spend some money, uh, if you spend so, any, for, for any type of equipment less than $5,000, that's supplies, right? The research is here, less than $5,000. Thousand dollars is supply. When the cost is more than that, it's equipment, which is kind of hard to get. That's how you know it's difficult to get the money. Our print is, is actually for this one is four ninety nine, four hundred four thousand and ninety nine dollars, which means all researchers and medical institutions that have access to funding or some sort of funding, they can get it as a supply and not as an equipment. It's a very important detail, folks. And now we're working in our second one. That's going to be the super duper one, right? That, and that one is going to, of course, it's going to have a margin of in the $20,000. So. Yes, sir? So the patients are being treated with these uh, devices. Have you had to replace them? What is the, what is the end of the bill in terms of time, especially with so. Right. Um, so it really varies depending on the children. The girls last longer than the boys. And um, we do find that the great part about 3D printing is if they break a piece of the device, we can just reprint that and put it on. We don't need to make the whole device over again. So that's been a great blessing for us. Um, and also when they grow and get bigger, we just can print a new device. It is really fairly low cost to do that. Um, as far as the durability um, and the usability, we're finding that our latest um, device that we have. This is our newest version, and it's much more functional for the kids, and they're getting a lot more use out of it. I should have I should have mentioned this earlier, but GenePeg is probably the best hand therapy in the state. It's a licensed OT and hand therapist, and Rakesh is a certified CPO. So it's a, you know, and also the owner of Innovative Prosthetics and Orthotics. She's asking if we can use some of these devices on the adult stroke patients. Actually, that's something we're just looking into now. One of the things we're developing is an exoskeleton that is myoelectric driven. So they'd be able to use their biceps or triceps. Maybe those are still working in order to activate active finger flexion. So that is something we're pursuing at this time. We actually got uh, some funding from the state uh, to develop that. So we, we have it developed, but it's, you know, when you develop something, it goes through 20, 25 iterations, so we're in the first one. Yes? So I think this is remarkable, and it's amazing work, and especially the fact that you um, provide these templates and so everybody in the world can print those and, and use them, as far as I understand. So I'm concerned about uh, people who may not have access to high quality materials and how much that matters. Somebody in Russia, for example, I saw there's a couple of dots on the, on the map. Yes, it is, and that happens a lot, actually. So now, what uh, our mode of work, we deal with medical institutions. So we have this initial 
design open to everybody, but the more sophisticated ones, uh, we, 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 we don't share those. And we, if we do, we do it with medical institution under a series of agreements. Um, and that's kind of the short answer to that. But I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss this later on. It's a lot to talk. Just to add to um, Professor, you know, like an, just being a certified cross studies for 20 years, that was one of the concern that how the 3D printed is going to take over the, what we have been doing for years and years because of the durability and the concerns that you have. And uh, initially, yes, you know, there was a lot of newspaper article that $50 hand and all like that, you know, how that can compete with something that's, uh, you know, 40,000 or 50,000. And that's what our team has been working on to provide some research backed with those devices, then just bringing out those technologies and making it cool and say that this works. And that's what our research is based on, providing those materials, the durability and all those concerns. So pretty good question. Thank you.